Welcome to the Redbeard Embodiment Podcast. I am your host, Alex Green, and I'm on a mission to bring the power of embodiment to people all around the world. In this podcast, we explore how embodiment practices, trauma healing, and knowledge about the human nervous system can help us find our ground, discover new sources of meaning, and create connection in an ever-changing world. The deepest change is it body change. All right. Good morning, everybody. I am here in Boulder, Colorado, as always, and I am sitting down today with Mark Walsh of the great pleasure and honor. He is uh, somewhere in the UK, I think maybe in Devon or uh, Southwestern UK. We can, where, where well, are I'm you, I'm usually Mark? in the Southwest of the UK in the Stonehenge, just to reference it, but right today I'm in Cologne in Germany. I'm doing a workshop tomorrow oh. here. So, um, I'm in a, 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 an Airbnb with slightly dodgy art on the walls, uh, but it looks like the Wi-Fi is good, Alex. <laughs> so I think, I think we're good. I think we're rolling. Perfect. Excellent. Well, uh, uh, if you are at all familiar, if you are uh, at all an embodiment person like I am, uh, there's a 90, about a 99.9% .9 likelihood that uh, Mark Walsh is on your radar. Uh, he is, I was looking up his official title, uh, and his official title is Overlord, patriarch, and trainer for Embodiment Unlimited. Nice. Uh, so, nice. uh, yeah, I've got a nice, a nice sub. I'm sick of the word CEO. Yeah, so yeah. That's that's a, I, we just thought we'd have some fun with that. So, a chief troublemaker used to be one, <laughs> but um, that's uh, we just we thought we'd have some fun, trigger some people. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, in any case, so if you um, so uh, Embodiment Unlimited is a, is a, a group that runs embodiment trainings and coaching all around the world. Uh, with uh, coursework online, in person. Uh, Mark is the uh, creative force and visionary behind the uh, Embodiment Conference, which was uh, a big deal in 2020. Probably, as far as I know, one of the largest Zoom-based online conferences that I've probably the largest we in the world. We think it was a think. world record. We didn't get the official Guinness thing because it was a lot of money and hassle to do it, but we think it was a world record, <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, so that was the Embodiment Conference. If you haven't heard of it, it, it brought together over a thousand teachers, five hundred thousand delegates, and uh, was a week long program. And uh, there's uh, the ripple effect from that conference is ongoing. It connected many, many people. Uh, there's ongoing um, uh, video and, and stuff that's still available. Uh, but in any case, uh, Mark, he's also the author of a couple of books: uh, Embodiment, Working with the Body and Training and Coaching and also the uh, book Embodied Meditation. So uh, just uh, there's probably more to go in terms of a Mark's embodiment career, but uh, that's at least a starting point for uh, locating you. And Mark and I, and just to locate us, Mark and I first met in person in, I looked up the date on my, I looked through my Facebook feed. This was in two, this time of year, it was November, 2015 at a little Zen retreat in Totnes, UK. Uh, led by Ginny Whitlaw, Whitelaw. I was there uh, assisting for that. And I remember some a couple of late night conversations with you, Mark. You may not remember, but I remember actually some of the early themes about um, uh, civilizational decay and decade were already oh, on your yeah. mind eight years ago. So <laughs> so part of what I'm interested in in uh, our conversation here today is just a chance to hear a little bit about uh, Mark's story. Uh, you know, it's been eight years since we met in person and so much has happened in that time for for your uh, career. So I want to hear about that and, and as well as what you're up to now in terms of embodied coaching, who you teach, who you work with, what your methods are. And then I'm hoping we can spend a little time. You know, I've been seeing some of your podcasts, videos and writings, uh, this theme of, uh, you know, are we at a you know, I, I think of you as a bit of a sort of a historian in, 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 well, in we, one way and. And uh, and you sort of been looking at it from a, a lens of are we at a stage of civilizational decay, looking at certain things, trends in our uh, in our global culture. So maybe that's something we can look at. And also just uh, are there ways is that part of is, it does embodiment have anything to do? Uh, is there any solution offered through uh, embodied awareness or something like that? So anyway. That's what I'm hoping we cover today, Mark. Pleasure, Alex. Yeah, great introduction. Nice to be here. Yeah, awesome. Wonderful. So let's just, you know, why don't we kind of, 
go backwards in time just a little bit. Um, maybe you could just, you know, I, I know you know, uh, at a minimum, I know of your uh, significant Aikido training in your youth, but there's more than that. And I think part of, part of my understanding of your uh, embodiment uh, trajectory included at one point sort of, you know, a, 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 a pretty diverse and eclectic approach studying um, um, uh, tango and other things. And so I'd love to hear how even just uh, your roots in body to training and then how that coalesced into the field that you're now so directly in. Yeah, I mean, Aikido was my first kind of way into the embodiment world. Um, <clears throat> I discovered personally what Western civilization has also discovered, which is that a hypercognitive approach to life doesn't make you happy. Um, and mm -hmm. I, you know, I crashed into sort of alcoholism and drug abuse and suicidal ideation at quite a young age. And I went, hang on a minute, mm. I'm supposed to be this really intellectual, bright kid. I've read all the books in the library. Uh, why am I not happy? What, what, what's missing? What do I need? Uh, and it became very obvious mm. to me that um, physicality, which had been presenting to me just as fitness or sports, uh, I started looking mm. into it and I realized that there was this whole uh, notion of Budo, a way to develop the self through martial arts and then yoga or other approaches. Mm. And I realized there was a whole world and uh, Aikido opened up a beautiful world for me. I became obsessed with that. I was a living Aikido student for a number of years. Um, and after a while, that kind of got diminishing returns from Aikido. Uh, beautiful art as it is. I'm still very grateful to Aikido. And I thought, well, what else is out there? And am developing all the aspects of being human from Aikido? And my conclusion was, no, mm -hmm. I'm doing some very significant things. I developed discipline. I developed you know, a certain backbone, a certain embodiment, a certain work ethic. Um, but I realized there was other things that I was uh, developing other sides of myself. And, you know, these days, you know, when I teach coaches, we could break that down into embodied intelligence models. We could break that down into different qualities, different skills. Uh, I kind of intuited that. And then I started looking elsewhere. And then I realized how big the embodiment world was. And for the sort of next 10, 15 years, it was my kind of my work. And it, I guess still is my life's work really to survey it. And I started, you know, going to all the dance I could, doing all the body work I could, even doing improv comedy, mm. uh, studying other martial arts, studying a lot of yoga, meditation, of course. And I, you know, I realized that there's this whole field that sees the body uh, as more than a piece of me. And it didn't really have a name. Some people would call it somatic. Some people would say body mind arts. And I, I thought, you know what, let's just, let's give this a name. And embodiment obviously is already in the English lexicon. Other people were using the word, of course, previous to me. And, but I said, you know what, let's make a field here. And then mm -hmm. started doing things like a, you know, a podcast. We're up to episode 550 or something now. Uh, we did a big conference, mm -hmm. several of those online. Um, and I just went, you know what, so I was surveying it through my own practice and exploration, different teachers studying trauma, studying this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then also went, okay, let's, let's kind of make an umbrella and put it under this and see what happens. And that's really been my career, I guess. Yeah. Wonderful. What, um, you know, in terms of when you look at the, the coach curriculum that you, uh, have today, tell us just a little bit about that, because my, my, my assumption is that you have brought a, together a lot of these different threads. Maybe you could just share a little bit about how those threads have coalesced into a, a curriculum and, and how, how you teach that. Yeah. So, I mean, basically, it's if you want to do change, you need to work with the body because it's a key part of how we are. Um, the body is a great way of practically getting to something. It's hard to change someone's mind or their spirit, but you can do a breath technique, you can do a posture technique. And I guess what I realized was not everybody is going to do something like, you know, study Aikido and be thrown around and there's a lot of barriers to entry there. And, you can think of all of Aikido as a form of embodiment coaching to you know, develop you if you want. It's a very Japanese kind of mm -hmm. model of Budo. But I realized most people won't do that. And coaching seemed a great vehicle. Uh, so, you know, I started studying coaching, already had a psychology background. Um, there are other people in the embodiment coaching space as well. I was probably one of the first in Europe, but not in the world. Um, and gradually mm -hmm. realized, like, okay, there's certain things that just work. So there's certain things that were a little bit sort of Californian and esoteric and we kind of let go of. And then other things, like, I don't know, like, for example, I did a bunch of coaching today and we need to always start with a centering exercise because the coachee nearly always turns up in a state of fight or flight. They're stressed out. Life's busy for everyone these days. You know, society's how it is. We'll come to that in a bit. They're all messed up. Their brain's not working very well. And, you know, they're doing what they've always done. So they're getting what they've always got. So what do we do? First thing mm. would be, you know, a little bit of centering the state management. You know, I've got quite good at that. So mm. 
to reduce their arousal mm -hmm. levels and get them into a more kind of uh, creative state where they can have new ideas, you know, mm -hmm. new solutions to their problems. Um, you know, the thing is, like the definition of madness is people um, do the same thing and expect a different result. But the reason they do the same thing sure. is because they're the same person. Their being is the same. So embodiment, you know, embodied coaching goes mm -hmm. to that level of the person, the being. And we can work with states, we can work with traits, and we can shift those mm -hmm. in order for people to start seeing different, you know, seeing their problems differently, seeing different options, coming up with different solutions. Um, so, yeah, and then we might give them practices to embed those kind of things. We might use the body to develop insights. Uh, we might take mm. them through a series of different embodiments that are relevant to their challenge. You know, if they're working with boundaries, we have a pose for that. So, you know, working on life purpose, we have a number of poses that would work well with that. So we've got some just really practical mm. tools. And I felt like it only takes me like six months to train an embodied coach. Like it's like pretty quick mm. because once you get the basic mm -hmm. idea, the principles of it and a few basic tools, then it is pretty straightforward, actually. Mm. Mm. So, so for that six month, it, it, it remind me of the name for that. Um, cause I, I've seen well, that there's a, thank you for the plug, Alex. I appreciate it. It's a certificate yeah. of embodiment coaching. We do it every year. It usually starts in February. Um, pretty reasonably priced yeah. cause it's online. So we, you know, we have a, a very organized German woman in charge of it. If you don't have a German woman in charge of your mm. life, Alex, you should. Um, it's extremely, okay. extremely pleasant. She organizes everyone. And, mm -hmm. you know, we take people on a journey of sort of personal growth and deepening their own embodied practice, their own centering, their own practices. You know, we, the yeah. martial artists, we send dancing, the dancers, we send to martial arts, we <laughs> find ways to bring balance to everyone. <laughs> and then we just give them these nuts and bolts techniques and they practice them and have a peer group. And it's just a, like a well-designed right. online course and, um, yeah, pretty affordable, yeah, yeah. which I'm proud of. And well, my, my life's work has yeah. been putting this stuff out there in, in big ways and, you know, I find that training coaches yeah. is pretty good use of my time because then they can bring that embodied sensibility to a lot more people. Yeah. Well, what these days, what percentage of your time is um, training other coaches versus coaching yourself versus something else you might be? Yeah, I mean, there's a mixture of things. So like today, for example, I had two coaching clients, which is pretty typical, one or two a day for half an hour. Mm -hmm. I like to keep my, I mm -hmm. keep my foot in coaching myself if I'm training coaches, that feels fair. Um, quite a big chunk sure. of my day is running the company. You know, I employ certain people. So today I had a meeting with a team. Um, and then the creating all the resources is a big part of the day. So I might spend an hour making videos for Instagram. We do reels there. I might spend an hour on the podcast. You know, there's, that's quite a big chunk of the day. Mm. Um, I supervise mm. a charity that's based in Ukraine. So I'm, that might be part of my day. I'm uh, talking to some of the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. uh, I might have a business client that might be part of my day. Tomorrow is a live workshop. I, I found... Teaching online is great for reach. It's great for accessibility. Someone in New Zealand or someone with an aging parent say you can do the course. Um, it's mm. extremely good for keeping the cost down. It's good for drip feeding learning so you don't overwhelm people. Mm. But yep. you lose embodied skills if you don't, I think, as an embodied trainer. You need to work person to person. You need to be around bodies. So usually once a month, mm. like tomorrow, I'm teaching in Cologne, I'm teaching in London in two weeks. About once a month, I'll do mm. a one or two day workshop. And sometimes we do like nature retreats, you know, somewhere beautiful like Slovenia, it's nice, Austria. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's kind of a mix. I like to keep it diverse. And I mean, it's basically just embodiment in different packages and for different people. Mm. 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 Yeah, yeah. Um, I wonder if we could touch a little bit upon uh, the embodiment mm. conference. And I know you've, there's been several versions, but you know, the first one was to me just so epic in scale. Um, what was that like for you both to both to envision it, make it happen? How did it go? What 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 ripple effects has has, has that had? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, amazing life highlight and never again. There's the there's two things I'd say. Yeah. Um, so very mixed experience. Yeah. Um, the one you're talking about was actually the second one. So five years ago, we did the first one. Zoom had just been invented. Okay. People actually mocked us and said, you can't do embodiment online. And we said, well, you can't do everything, but yep. you know, we could offer some presenters. I realized you could, we could uh, offer like this wealth of embodiment teachers, many of whom I knew through the podcast or through my travels. And I mm -hmm. you know, met in different countries. And I thought, you know, I'm pretty well placed. To, and literally, I invited mm -hmm. 50 trainers and they all said yes by text message one evening. And by the next mm -hmm. morning, I had 50 trainers mm -hmm. for the first conference. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, and that went pretty well. And we went, oh, great, 15,000 people turned up. And we thought, that's pretty cool. 
um, maybe we can just do this 10 mm. times as big because I, I like a challenge. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, how big can this get? Like, I'm always like curious. And I was just like, you know, maybe this is my Mount Everest kind of thing. And I just thought, you know, screw <laughs> it. Like, how big can this be? And I thought, well, last time Daniela, right. she's the German manager that I led it with. I said, maybe Daniela could train 10 Danielas. And then instead of 100 teachers, yeah. we could have 1,000 teachers, which is completely insane. Live as well. No one's ever done that. Like, that's completely bonkers. Right. I uh, just thought, thought, well, we've got to right. cover all of embodiment and we need to give some new people a chance. And we need to have, you know, once you know embodiment, you realize there's so many great just trauma teachers, let alone yoga teachers and martial arts teachers. So we really, you know, tried to get yeah. different people from different countries and different backgrounds and different perspectives and um, turned yeah. into this monster. And then COVID hit. Um, I actually mm. had to go to China and eat a bat and, um, you know, make that happen. And what that meant was, uh, the our conference that we'd planned for 150,000 actually ended up being half mm -hmm. a million. And I remember, I remember there was uh -huh. a time when I went to an investor because I actually borrowed a million dollars to, to make it happen, um, which is terrifying. Uh -huh. so, you know, I'm not from a wealthy family. That's a terrifying proposition. And I said, look, yep. if I spend a dollar, we'll probably make a dollar 20 because we'll sell the recordings, but I need to borrow the money. Uh -huh. And they were like, well, that's a huge risk. You know, what if no one buys it? I'm like, that would be a problem. Um, but then we crowdsourced it, we borrowed some money, we made it happen. It was a big success. I mean, obviously it was the most stressful yeah. thing I've ever done in my life. I mean, the three of us led mm -hmm. it. It was Manal yeah. from Saudi Arabia, Daniela from Germany and, and me. The three of us led it as a team. There's about 25 full-time employees and maybe 50 half-time employees, a bunch of volunteers. The most intense 10 days of my life, you know, being psychoanalyzed mm -hmm. by Gabor Mate live in front of thousands of people. I was just going to, that's just what I was going to say to me that the standout moment of uh, the thing that stands out most of my memory was that, that, that I think you were doing sort of a keynote, well, maybe not, I, I don't know what you would call it, a uh, plenary uh, interview with Gabor Mate. And I don't know if you knew in advance, but to me, I've seen enough of Gabor at work to know that it, it, it is his uh, custom is to, uh, he just likes to, to bring it, bring it into the moment. And but there, there he did a, you know, kind of his compassionate inquiry psychoanalysis method. I, I, and I was going to ask you about that. What was, what, you'd spent a few years. What was, how yeah, was, was that? What was that like? an hour before I hear like, oh, well, you know, Gabor needs a, um, a volunteer. And I was like, well, we can't uh. just ask someone randomly from the audience because it could just be a crazy person. It could just be someone that's disruptive. You know, people had all sorts of political agendas right. and things going on, you know. Um, so I thought, you know what, yeah. I might as well just step up to the plate as I'm introducing him anyway, kind of rather than just grab someone right. random. I thought, you know what, it, I think it was an act of vulnerability that people appreciated that they weren't used to seeing from leaders. Mm. Um, it was pretty intense. Mm. And actually, I had to draw a line with him. Like he kind of pushed it to an area that I thought was actually a bit too personal in front of thousands of people. So I actually did draw a boundary, which he did respect. Um, and obviously since yeah, then he's yeah. sort of blown up as a megastar, you know, doing stuff with Prince Harry. Sure. I saw him on a major TV show yesterday. Um, this trauma was yeah. just getting big at that point. Like now it's trauma as a household word at the time. It was just, you know, there was others like Stephen Forges, Pete Levine, uh, mm -hmm. David Baselli, Irene Lyon, you know, all these different trauma teachers there at the event. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I would say though that the, the conference blew up all of a sudden i was in charge of a tech multi-million pound tech business afterwards and actually mm. that was a nightmare like you know mm. like the year after the conference i think we made and spent 2.2 million uh, pounds so it's like I, I was like hang on a minute this isn't a better business it's just way more stressful and way more management it's yeah, just yeah. Hu it's, it's like, huge it's, i'm not, yeah, I'm not yeah. suddenly making millions it's like money's going in and money's going out and actually, I'm now I'm a tech right. manager, which I'm totally unqualified for. So how have I become a tech CEO? Right. Um, you know, I'm looking at email open right. rates and Facebook ads and all this shit. And I'm like, I'm just an embodiment teacher. And the other thing was I get recognized right. from it. You know, I'd walk, I'd walk into a yoga mm. class and people would have an opinion. And, you know, unfortunately, uh -huh. the sort of woke cancel culture people kind of came after me. And that was just, they didn't actually have a fair point, but they, they were very unpleasant. Mm. And I... I was naive. I thought the embodiment world was just full of nice people because I knew people like Jimmy and people like my teacher, Paul Lind, and they were just nice mm. people. And it turns out mm. there's some pretty damaged people would be a kind way of saying it in the world. And as soon as you get to mm. a certain scale, they want to cash mm. in on that. And then it was a sort of at the mm. height of this culture of people kind of wanting to make you know, accusations that aren't real, people 
they trying to do cancel stuff on the internet. And it didn't work. They didn't yeah. cancel the conference, but it was very unpleasant. And I thought, God, if this is what mm. comes with a little bit of fame, if this is what comes with a little mm. bit of success, I mean, even just like yeah. going to a yoga class and it's a very low level. It's not like Johnny Depp level of fame, right? But, you know, I remember going to yoga class and I, someone wasn't happy with the way I was putting the blocks away. And they said, oh, I thought I, I expected better from an embodiment teacher. And I'm just like, who are you? I don't, I'm just coming here to do yoga. I'm trying to chill on a Thursday evening. You know what I mean? So it's just, and I just, right. well, I don't really yeah. want to be a manager or running a tech business um, or being recognized. Yeah. It's just unpleasant. The fame is very toxic yeah. and money has got its ups and downs. And so now, you know, now we're like a much smaller business and just employ five people. Mm. You know, it's much, much mm -hmm. more chill. We do coach trainings. I have a little charity. We do the podcast. It's much more like the lifestyle yeah. actually, you know, I'm training like 20 people in Cologne tomorrow at a nice little workshop for coaches. It's fine. Thank you. So, um, yeah, yeah but it was good. You know, when you're a young yeah. man, I think it's good to be ambitious. Now I'm middle-aged and jaded. I don't care anymore, but it was, it was good to sort of see how, you know, it's like, let's see where this goes, you know, let's see how much this technology yeah. goes. And, um, I took it as far as it went. And after that, I started to look for new things really. Yeah. Well, and in, in terms of, uh, um, and in terms of putting a lot of people in the same room, you know, the, the, you know, the Peter Levines, the Gabermates, the, um, but, but widening that circle, uh, and, 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 and bringing people into one sort of collective, uh, I, I am the impression sort of from the outside, just as an audience member was, I, I, my sense was, wow, a lot of cross fertilization yeah. is, is being fomented in this, you know, by bringing, especially, you know, this was, this was the first year of COVID. It was a pretty unusual moment in, in, I think it helped know, a lot of contemporary people. history. I mean, other than, yeah. you know, we gave money to different charities or whatever, but it was also, it helped yeah. a lot of people at a difficult time. We made a lot of information mm. freely available. Like, you know, obviously we had to sort of right. have a fine line there, but there's a lot of it you can find on our podcast for free, on our app for free. A lot of it, we like, you know, the YouTube, yep. for example, Alanis Morissette interviewing Pete Levine, Stephen Porges, mm. Gabble Mate, and who was the other one? Someone else super famous, like, you know, on YouTube for free for anyone who wants it. Like, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people found their teachers yeah. there as well. So a comment I hear is, oh, I first met Kathleen Booker at your thing, or I first heard of this teacher. And that's cool, you know, because mm -hmm. well, I'm not everyone's cup of tea. You know, no, no teacher mm -hmm. is everyone's cup of yeah. tea. So in order to make a platform where people could find teachers and students, that, you know, that feels like a service to the world. And for me personally, it was just fun to have a ridiculous challenge. And, you know, if it's, you know I, mm -hmm. I like a challenge. So, um, yeah, I'm kind of mm -hmm. glad I did it. Kind of wished I had him. I don't know, at this point, more good, than, more more good was done than bad with that, I think in the in the sort of balance of things. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe, well, maybe your Everest analogy is apropos because uh, huge success on the one hand, and maybe Lost uh, limp. you know maybe Lost a couple a couple of injuries, yeah, some, <laughs> some frostbite. It's, not, yeah. it's the public the, the public <laughs> accusations of public Chris is not much fun, man. It's really like unless you're an actual sociopath, yeah. is really not much fun. Like it's not much fun. Uh, so I don't yeah. recommend that to anyone. Yep. And the people that do no, that, no. they're way worse people than they make out. They're just unpleasant and they're, they're very selfishly motivated. But it's, um, I don't want that to be the final sign. I mean, I tend to, I tend to do yeah, a sort yeah, of ridiculous yeah. project every two years. I mean, I went to Ukraine two years later. That was the, you know, that was the next challenge. Yeah, yeah. Right? Well, that, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's was next on my, that's where I was going. That's what I wanted to ask about next. So, so yeah. And I only heard a little bit and I talked to Dr. Priscelli, David, a oh, bit, great. you know, he mentioned something about it. Um, but uh, yeah, tell us, tell us about that. And I think you had already been doing some training in Ukraine. Maybe you have a connection there. Just, yeah. What, what was that project and what's ongoing from uh, it? Yes. Yeah, so um, I've worked a lot in Russia and a lot in Ukraine previous to the war. Um, so we used to run sure. coach training in Russia. So I speak some Russian from going there multiple times. Um, I also met yeah. my wife, uh, in Ukraine. So I was involved okay. in the Maidan protests and in the aftermath of that, they had a lot of trauma. There was sort of the war now is actually just a ramped up version of what was a sort of unofficial invasion before that in the, in the Eastern regions. Mm. And I was asked to do some trauma work and in order, to, they couldn't mm. really afford to pay me much, but I said, okay, I'll do it. 
and they set me up. They basically mm. just made sure all my translators were hot single Ukrainians. And because um, they knew mm. I didn't sleep with any of my students, but translators was a gray area. So, so I all of a sudden had seven single <laughs> attractive translators. I was like, what's going on here? And um, it actually ended right. up marrying one of them. Um, so everybody won mm. uh, in that setup. Um, so I then went to Ukraine a bunch of times. And then when the, the this part of the invasion happened, obviously I wanted to do something. And actually my first thing was to go fight. And then luckily I, I spoke to my friend Alex and he said, don't be stupid. You'll be a rubbish soldier and you'll get shot, but you're a very good trauma trainer because I've been working with trauma for a long time. Mm. Um, so mm. I thought, what's the most useful thing I can do? So I think it was week three of the war. It was really early days. I flew out to Poland. I've got an old Aikido friend who's Polish who's became my driver and we went across the border, delivered a load of medical supplies to a children's hospital. We'd fundraise like I don't know, $75,000 of medical funds. Um, delivered. What, what month was that? Was, this was month one. the invasion was what? February? Yeah, this was March. This, this like is, three so weeks. This was, we right were, away, no, I mean, think right the airports yep. were getting bombed next to the place I was at. Like it was out. No one knew what was happening. It was out of chaos. You know, we were seeing refugees yep. going across the border, which I'll never forget. That's just like scarred on my memory what that looked like. Um, you know, mm. we were in the V, which is relatively safe, but you know, the airport was bombed while we were there and things were going on. Um, no one knew what was really going to happen or really, what was happening. Um, and mm. yeah, I decided to talk to some local therapists and they said, well, we're sort of overwhelmed with trauma trait cases, but what would be really useful is if you trained a bunch of young psychology people. So, um, in what's called trauma first aid, uh, which is very helpful in the immediate okay. aftermath of trauma. Um, and uh, yeah. psychological education, basically saying, well, this whole country needs to learn about trauma. Uh, so I right. just hired a room in a hotel and went to the local university and said, who wants to help? And uh, 10 young psychologists said, we'll help, who are just graduating their MA. MA. And um, right. yeah, basically started a charity and it's now run by, uh, I went there a couple of times. Uh, just a few weeks ago, I met the team in Krakow. We decided it's better to do the trainings in Poland where we're not getting bombed. It's a little bit annoying when you're mm, doing a training yeah. and you have to keep running to the bomb shelter and it's not the most comfortable place to do a training, a bomb shelter. Um, so sure. yeah, now they, you know, it's run by local women, these young local psychologists who I'm extremely proud of. And, you know, I help yeah. out. I do a little bit of training with them, a little bit of supervision, a little bit of support in different ways. They mm. get grants now off the Red Cross and, you know, they've really in the last two years built a great reputation as a little organization. And I mean, they've made Lviv the world's most trauma aware city. They've trained hundreds mm. of thousands of people in trauma education. They've trained, for example, you know, all the doctors, nurses, and teachers in Lviv, which is one of the biggest cities in Ukraine. They're now awesome. working yeah. on Kiev. They're working in um, yeah. Odessa. They're working in Zaporizhia, to the center. Um, yeah, just doing great work. And I think all I did was really sort of get them started and give them some basics. And now they're really running with it. So, mm. um, yeah, I'm a... What's what's the what's the name of the it's charity? Sane the Ukraine. If people Google Sane Ukraine. If anyone's got a few million that wants nice. to throw it at them, as I said, now I don't run the charity. I'm simply a, you know outside help for them when they need it. And um, mm. as I said, I'm super proud right. of you know young women that were really putting themselves in harm's way, and they've really um, you know they deal with a lot psychologically. Some of the topics we talk about, I won't put on a podcast because they're just horrific, and. Um, yeah. You know, like one of them, for example, runs a women's trauma center in Kiev now. She's in charge of, you know, some celebrity gave her funding and she's in charge of that. And it's, you know, it's pretty horrific mm -hmm. what they're dealing with. And they deal with it with a smile yeah. and they're a great bunch. And um, it's been the honor of my life, frankly, mm -hmm. to work with them. And I see it actually as a much big, bigger mm -hmm. achievement and a much better thing than the embodiment conference in many ways. Um, so it's a very mm -hmm. interesting juxtaposition because it was a charity and it was... <laughs> you know, very different kind of thing. Um, I am a bit worried though, because sure. I seem to do something stupid every two years and next year I'm due for something stupid again. So, um, do, any inklings I, I of what that know. is? I don't know, I'm worried. Hasn't, hasn't come into I view might have yet. children or something. <laughs> I don't know, something really wild. I don't know, but, um, <laughs> uh, you know, my, I'm, my wife's obviously yeah. a bit anxious, you know, when that happens. We're, we're about due, you know, next spring for something. So we'll see. Yeah. Right, interesting. Well. Wow. Well, so I guess on the maybe the topic of uh, war is a is a good is, is you know is and obviously we're a, we're a world at war these days. Um, but but maybe segueing into this um, that topic that I teed up at the beginning, mm -hmm. you know, you've been you've been you've been thinking and talking about 
you know, well, you know, what's the state of global culture? What's the state of uh, Western civilization, maybe in particular, um, although Western civilization, you know, we're, you know, we're in unusual times due to, you know, globalization and whatnot. But, 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 and you've used this term of decadence and mm-hmm. decay and, and, and the cycles of civilization and, and give just a little bit about, about what you, what you've been thinking and talking about on that subject. Yeah. So as an embodiment teacher, one of the things I've become aware of is we're always embodied in context. And so we're not just, mm. you know, we are a body, right? But we're also a practice and we're also in a cultural context. Mm. You know, so, you know, training in Europe, you only have to go a couple of hours on a train, you're in a different country, and you really see the difference between the Germans and the Italians and the Russians and the Slovenians or whatever. Like, I'm really seeing that. Like, I'm working all over Europe every year, like 15 countries. So the cultural context is one, the environmental context. So when we're in nature, you know, in the Austrian Alps or whatever, people are very different in their embodiment than when they're in a big city like Cologne, where I am today, you know. Um, so this is an mm-hmm. environmental mm-hmm. context. And the uh, one thing that came away with me, as, so history is kind of a hobby. I'm a kind of history buff. I watch YouTube videos on history. I read books and now I enjoy it. And I went, oh, we're actually in a particular point of history. Okay. Um, so that is part of our context. And there's different views of history. Some are more linear, like the sort of basic Western view actually is one of progress is the implicit view that we're, you know, just sure. Trudeau says, because it's the current year, you know, there's some idea of a directionality or a progress. That's not the Indian view. That's right. not the Chinese view. That's not the traditional Aboriginal view, for example. And actually many historians yeah. have a more cyclical view of history. Um, mm. Now there's different models of this. Some are crude, some are sophisticated, some are modern and American, some are German from the turn of the century. Some are, you know, even the Romans had some understanding of this, that history goes through cycles. Mm. And, you know, very mm. crudely, often, often you'll have a, a civilization which will have a vigorous period where it's usually quite violent and mm. conquering. Then it will have a sort of civilizing period. Um, and then it will have a decaying or a decadent period. Um, and, mm. you know, there's various memes on this, at good times, hard men, things like this. And um, it has a kind mm, of common right. sense appeal, which while history doesn't exactly repeat, you know, you can say it rhymes. Mm. There are, there are. For example, the fall of the Roman Empire, they were, had celebrity sports people, celebrity chefs. They were obsessed with gender. They had high levels of inflation and borrowing. Uh, and I could name, they had environmental destruction. They had high inequality between rich and poor. And I could name 15 mm-hmm. features of late Roman Republic that absolutely we have mm-hmm. today. Parallel our, our, our moment in time right now. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I, what okay. I would say, though, is we need to take some of these cyclical theories a little bit lightly because, you know, empires don't you can't predict this to a time scale there are people that have you know generationally um it's hard to predict Mm. exactly it's a very inexact science history uh the other thing i would say is that we Mm. are under novel conditions um post-modernity is new for example and technology that we find ourselves in today is new and essentially we're in a period uh both due to uh, the tech, the postmodernity, and to do with this uh, historical decadence period. We're, we're a very unusual civilization because we're a civilization that claims not to be one. Um, so if you mm. talk about the American empire, most Americans would find that a strange idea. Would say, were, what? Yeah, right, what are you there is about? an American yeah. empire. And before that, yeah. there was a British empire. And one sure. sort of segued into the other, and they kind of have a shared language, and they, they didn't go to war. And also, we're talking about the West, right. and you could, you could you know, get pedantic and say, well, where are the boundaries of the West? Does Australia count? Does South America count? But there is a coherent yeah. worldview. There is a coherent set of values. Uh, and we could say the yeah. West generally, and the American empire in particular, or the Anglo-American empire, the Anglo empire, the Anglo-speaking empire, is in a period of decay and yeah. shows all the features of decay. And that has consequences mm. for people psychologically and emotionally. Um, particularly Mm. just to take the kind of central one, you'll see the rise in mental ill health, for example. Like people are crazier Mm. than they've ever been. Like that is just obvious. Mm. They're more addicted, they're more suicidal, they're more mentally ill. And some of that's a diagnostic Mm. thing to do with people, you know, in the past were less willing to be nice. But like when I go to Mm -hmm. the library and the most popular books in a small English town are on anxiety and depression, when I walk down the street and I see the drug addicts that weren't on the street before and America is worse, you know, when yeah. I talk to my friends and they're talking about their suicidal children, I go, mm. something is up. Yeah. And mm. the meaning making mm. system of the West has collapsed. We 
have mm. just decay, decayed, not just in the sense of normal decadence, where in a decadent empire, the values of the empire are replaced by hedonism. So if you, you know, imagine the Romans sort of swilling wine and watching, you know, bread and circuses kind of thing, you know, there's a modern equivalent of that, sure. whether it be YouTube and, and fentanyl, you know? Um, yeah. So we've lost the meaning yeah. making and actually uniquely, because the West is, has got unique features as well as similar features to say the Aztecs or Arabs or whatever. Uh, there's a form of kind of mm. uh, what's called oikophobia, which is the safe, it's the opposite of xenophobia, which is the se the self hatred of the West. Uh, uh, which, I see. What's the word? What's that word? So it's a British philosopher who coined the term uh, from the Greek. You'll hear it pronounced mm. differently by Greek people, but oikophobia is the general pronunciation, mm -hmm. and it means um, hatred of one's own fear, fear of ha fear hatred, hatred of one's, of one's own culture. Own culture. Um, so you'll see yeah, that. Yeah particularly in youth and particularly in sort of left counterculture. So it's, you think of it as a spectrum. Yep. So you've got xenophobia, which you know, isn't healthy on one extreme, and oikophobia on the other end mm. of that uh, scale. So for example, I once put on Facebook, yep. what's great about Britain? And 90% of the responses were sarcastic. Now, people could have said the Beatles, they could have said Shakespeare, they could have said the beautiful countryside in the mm. Cotswolds, they could have said our sense of humor, yeah. uh, they could have said our cuisine, okay, maybe not that one. Okay, there's things they could have said, and instead, most of the responses were cynical, so decadent cultures get very cynical. Mm. And right. I would say we could look at it in the round, and we could say, you know what, there's a lot of good about Britain, or the West generally, America specifically, perhaps, and there's mm, bad too. Sure. And yeah. you know what? We're yeah. not the worst culture that's ever lived. You know, like you, you mm. think we, we're the most racist, sexist, homophobic culture that's ever lived. You're, you're wrong. and You need to study mm. more history. Yeah. Interesting. So I guess sort of two questions come up in my mind. What, one is like, you, you know, you mentioned, you know, something that's different is, is where post-modernity, you know, the, the technology is one Roman history, Chinese history. Nobody was dealing <laughs> with, uh, VR well, and, Romans and, had uh, porn, the internet, but they didn't have and, the level of porn we had. And AI, <laughs> they didn't have the level of porn that we have. Exactly. So, so I, I, it, it, that's a theme I've actually become interested yes, in yes. from from an embodiment yeah, yeah. perspective. Is is sort of uh, I I did an interview with a guy a couple months ago, a, a cool cool guy in uh, American guy in Japan, and his field is VR yes. and AR, and I, not something I've done much of. But since that conversation, I've I gotta. <laughs> VR headset and and because I got curious. Well, you know, where 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 are we going to be in ten years? What are we going to be doing with a a headset? What therapeutics are going to be happening? Uh, you know, on, on one level, to me, sticking slapping on a VR goggles feels like a a pretty cognitive and and potentially disembodied activity. Uh, yet uh, there may be ways that that there's uh, surprises in store. So I'll, I'll never say never on things like that. But. Um, but I guess like, so is, if, if you're correct, as I, I agree with a lot of what I'm hearing here about your sort of assessment of uh, um, the read on, on a lot of the ailments, um, uh, mental health is horrific. Um, so what's the, um, so if it's true, if we're, if we're in a decadent, if, if we're in a decadent phase yes. from this you know, historical perspective, um, uh, then what uh, is, is your, is your inter, is, is the field of embodiment um, uh, uh, have anything to Are do we with what it means to be a human? Be Are we screwed? <laughs> yeah. What we should we party on the <laughs> should we play the violin on the Titanic on the way down? What what what, 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 what to do? Hookers. Yeah. No, um, not yeah. what I recommend. So um, first of all, we are really screwed, both historically. You, there are ways people bounce back from decadence. You know, for example, Byzantium was a continuity of the Roman Empire for a thousand years after the Western Empire fell. Uh, there are renewals, there are race right. renaissances. You know, there are uh, pockets where the kind of original values survive when the rest collapses in on itself. Um, so there are, you know, historical mm. examples of, of things that are, um, give us hope. Um, as long as there's mm. a few good people, there's always hope. I think even if it only exists in small communities away from California and New York. Um, so, you know, there's always <laughs> possibilities. Yeah. The technology is a particular right. challenge in the, as well as this decadence, which is nihilism, narcissism, and hedonism, the sort of three main horsemen of it, which is that's traditional. When we see those things, nihilism, yep. no one believes in anything, yep. narcissism, everyone's taking selfies. And, you know, you could also say just right. fragility. I mean, frankly, 
Mm. I'm less fragile than the average British man my age, but my grandfather would laugh at how fragile I am. You know, my World War II mm. Irish mm. grandfather, you know, serving in the Navy, you know, he'd put a nail through his hand and refuse to go to hospital. Like, he would just laugh at me. Um, and I, you know, <laughs> equally, I, I see the young men walking around and honestly, most of them look fragile and unwell. Um, and I go, mm. there's something that needs to be done here. And I think the good news mm. is things have got bad enough that mindfulness, embodiment, these kind of tools are a necessity, not a luxury. You know, I, I did like, you know, cause mm. I needed to, cause I was, you know, depressed myself. Now, if you're not doing mm. yoga or meditation, I mean, how can you, we're a mental health tipping point in the West. And I think mm. the sort of transhuman trends in technology are particularly challenging in that yeah. as soon as AI is linked to porn, that's probably the end of human breeding in that it will be addictive at a level that people cannot understand when virtual reality becomes far more interesting than the decaying outside world, people will just retreat into that. Um, yeah. There are going to be conflicts there are going to be huge changes uh, you talk to anyone who knows anything about ai you will find it terrifying um i've got some mm. friends who are optimistic about it i'm not i say smash the robots now um i you know i had an ai mm. trying to record the coaching call i was doing yesterday and saying you know i'm i'm taking notes on this and i'm like oh god you know i've been told that we that that's I Yesterday, that yeah. happened to me twice. I got an email an hour before a meeting, and it said, I'm the AI assistant that's going to be joining your call. Just introducing myself. No, no, you're myself. not. So, no, you're yeah. not. Smash the robots. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, sort of wise tech use, whether that be when you let your children have mobile phones, whether you decide to get a right. VR porn headset or whatever. Personally, I'm not going to go near one. Yeah. There's no way I would ever even try mm. that technology any more than I would try fentanyl or heroin. I just don't want to go there. Mm. Um, I, you know, yeah. I think there are precautions and there will be, there's, there's going to be a lot happening and this trend towards, uh, transhumanism is from technology, but it's also in the culture. You know, when someone says I identify mm. as X, I am not my body. What they're saying is my body is not relevant. My body doesn't matter. Mm. And the disembodiment mm. the trends that we see throughout culture at a number of levels, they do have severe consequences to people. And I, I, th mm. I think embodiment teachers do also, you know, have a lot to offer in terms of why people might be going crazy who are completely detached from their body. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, on that warm and fuzzy uh, <laughs> ass assessment. Um, yeah. Well, okay. I think I'm going to be, uh, I, I don't think I'll do the fentanyl heroin uh, uh, VR porn version, but uh, maybe I'll find, I'll, maybe I'll ecstatic dance my way into the uh the abyss um, yeah i my, mean my in embodiment you will see a trend towards just getting high you'll see that in the dance world and the breath work mm -hmm. world and some of that's just an escape yeah. from the world right and then sure. also you know there are reasons sure. for optimism the sort of stephen pinker stuff actually we no longer tolerate atrocities in war i mean the, the ukraine war for example the ukraine mm -hmm. invasion people were just like what the fuck guys come on we don't do this anymore mm -hmm. you know like there was a way in which mm -hmm. it seemed old-fashioned mm -hmm. So I, I, I think mm. the sort of liberal idea of progress has some merit in moving towards mm. greater care and inclusion and uh, less violence. And part of our growing out of postmodernity into kind of integral levels of consciousness, the next levels of human evolution mm. will be a return to the body mm. as well. Um, so, you know, we're in a, we're kind of a, this is a kind of race between two horses right now. And, um, you know, you just yeah. got to laugh. I think at the end of the day, you just got to laugh. It's not when the mm. AI starts sending mm. you messages. Yeah. Yeah, you do. Yes, you do. Um, well, Mark, this has been a, a wonderful uh, snippet of a conversation just to hear what you, you know, where you've come in these last eight years and, uh, and uh, all these big projects. I'll be keeping my ears open for, you know, you're saying you're coming on your two year mark next year. I'll be watching to see what, what madness uh, arises uh, from your direction. Um, uh, but yeah, this has been a real pleasure. What is, uh, I'll, of course, I'll put sure. all, all the links and things like that. Is there any, is there anything timely that, uh, that uh, people should be aware of? Uh, your, your podcast is excellent. It comes out uh, 
twice a week, at least yeah, once yeah. a week, if yeah. not more. Yeah, yeah twice a week. Podcast. The embodiment podcast. I mean, yeah. They can go there, but I mean, the main thing we're doing uh, is a certificate of embodiment coaching. If you want to train to be an embodiment coach, we can mm. help you how to do that. If yep. you're interested in that, go to embodimentunlimited.com. There's um, an app as well if you prefer apps. Loads of free stuff there too. So we've got a load of um, resources, coaching sessions, uh, big names from the embodiment conference that we're offering free there. Uh, there's a my first book, which we've sold loads of copies of, is actually free there as a PDF if you just want an intro to embodiment. Mm. Um, I'm on all the normal mm. socials, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, etc. Mark Walsh. Um, I think there's books out. They're the main ones, but I, I think the probably the the hub resource would be embodimentunlimited.com. You can find me there. Perfect. Great. Yeah, and I'll put all that in the show notes. Well, great. Well, Mark, uh, real pleasure. Uh, thanks for being on the. Oh, really the nice show. to reconnect, Alex. Nice to see you again. You know, the podcast's great. So just you know, well done on the podcast. Just having looking through some of the episodes. So great. some good stuff. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Redbeard Embodiment Podcast. To learn more, visit us at redbeardsomatictherapy.com or send me an email at alex at redbeardsomatictherapy.com. If today's conversation resonated with you, help spread the word by subscribing and sharing with others. Hope to see you next time.